welcome to all of you on this beautiful sunny day. Um, real gift to be together. I'm Beth Hayward, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a minister amongst you. And we were talking this week about, um, about the name tags and the pronouns, and I urge you, if it's your first Sunday or if you're here all the time, consider a name tag. I was at an event last evening, and the host stood up in front of us and said, you all know me, <laughs> and then proceeded to not tell us who, who they were, and I didn't know them. So, you know, sometimes new people are going to come to church if we wear our name tags and put our pronouns on, um, then they'll have a chance to speak to us. So, friendly reminder. You know that we gather on these traditional ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people, and this lily comes up to light the candle. I'm going to invite all of us um, to sort of settle into this time of worship. We come for so many different reasons, but you've shown up on a Sunday morning when there's a lot of other things you could do with your time. I'm going to assume that part of why we come is to be fed for the week ahead. And so this is the moment to just, yeah, hold whatever it's been for this week. Maybe there's been great successes. Maybe there's been a whole lot of anxiety. Maybe it's been kind of ordinary. This is a, a fresh start and a new week. Yeah, come on up and light that candle. This is our Christ candle. It's already in our midst. We light it as a symbol that that light is within us and around us. And so do take this time as we focus on the light. Notice your breath. Notice your very presence. We are in the presence of one another, but mostly we're in the presence of the Holy One who meets us wherever we gather. May that be enough to feed us in worship and for whatever this week holds. Now I said last week, and I'll say again, sometimes in the order of service it tells us when to stand up and when to sit down. If you do the wrong thing, there's no such thing. So um, stand or sit as you're able or as you feel called. We're going to sing our opening hymn now.
also part of the uh, Dartmouth Industry Pipe Band, and we use the lower hall downstairs for rehearsal. So thanks for the space. Can you get much closer? There we go. Uh, so I'd invite you all to share a greeting of peace with those around you. Peace of Christ be with you. We gather for coffee and conversation. That's sounding a little more. We gather for coffee and conversation following the worship. Uh, you can find that through the doors uh, behind me here or down the stairs. Blessings to all who are celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other milestones this week. A newsletter was sent out this week. Uh, if you didn't receive it and would like to be added to the list, please email the office so we can include you for next time. Next Sunday, we celebrate the 152nd anniversary of this church. Uh, our guest preacher will be the Reverend Canon Dr. Jody Clark, uh, who is a professor of pastoral theology at Atlanta School of Theology. The following week, we will have a congregational meeting immediately after the service to discuss the Manses uh, list of Christ. You'll want to save the date for our casual carols, Thursday, December 14th. Don't forget to pick up your carol sing requests sheet in the uh, Queen and Tobin Street lobbies. And please look in the order of service for other announcements. So please stand as you're able and join in singing together the creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is an exciting day today. It's uh, the Sunday that we present the order of Fort Massey. We're very blessed in this church. We have a lot of people who give a lot of time and share their talents. And it's uh, really appreciated, and that's what's helping Fort Massey carry out the outreach that it does and provide a welcoming environment for people. But this Sunday, however, we'd like to highlight uh, a few people. So, <clears throat> I'm going to start. So, the nominating committee has the hard job, a pleasant job, of looking at, uh, of choosing the candidates for the uh, order of fortnights. So I'm going to read out a little something about them so you can get to know people a little bit more. Hopefully you'll learn something a little bit. You. Anne and Albert. Anne began, began attending Fort Massey in the fall of 2015. She had just returned to Canada after living in the U.S. for 25 years, where she was an art, artist and curator of contemporary art. Anne says that she has found community at Fort Massey. Since arriving at Fort Massey, Anne has contributed to many aspects of the church life including ushering and counting collection. She's been involved with many events at the UCW, including book and bake sales and teas. And can often be found in the kitchen, helping with coffee and conversation. I present, I'm gonna ask Anne to come forward. I present Anne Nalbert, Order of 
Ford Massey. And going to hand out a certificate, and then we have an order of Fort Massey pin that Nancy's going to pin on hand. Nancy gets the hard job. Present Gail Gillis, Order of Fort Mass. Our next recipient uh, is Jacob Jensen. However, due to commitments with university, uh, he is not here, so we're going to present it next Sunday. Uh, I'm going to ask Lily Nor to come forward. Lily was baptized at Fort Massey and has been a regular participant at worship services. She encourages children to participate with her in the lighting of the Christ candle and has been a liturgical assistant in worship services. 
Lily staffs the nursery and helps with Sunday school, including organizing and taking part in the white gift services. Lily helps with the counting of the collection after services and is served at Valentine's and Christmas teas. Most recently, Lily was on the search committee for our permanent minister, Reverend Beth. I, I present Lily Moore, order of Fort Madison. and then uploading onto the Fort Massey YouTube channel. Also very good at technical problem solving. Saul is also the editor and videographer, videographer of our Living with Faith story that shows Fort Massey Church's faith in action through film. That film can be found on our YouTube channel. I present Saul Jansen, Order of Fort Massey. Still do hard things. 
So I want to tell you two things from scripture, and this is for all of us, helpful to remember. Um, do you know what the most often spoken phrase in the Bible is? And this could be a real test for folks, because I'm guessing if you don't get the answer, a lot of them won't either. Do you know what was said the most in the Bible? Any idea what it might have been about? No? Trick question. Anyone out there know what was... Hey, Bill, do you know what was said most in the Bible more than any other phrase? Don't be afraid or fear not. You know what? It's good. It's good when the entire pastor is getting right. <laughs> Don't be afraid. And likewise, the phrase that Jesus said the most times uh, was a similar sort of thing, a be not afraid sort of phrase. Right? So I'm thinking that's our goal for the week. But with a little interpretation, it's okay to be afraid, but try it anyway. So next time, Will you have a story for me, Daisy? No, no way. <laughs> um, but I'd love to hear your stories this week. Um, and in fact, you can post those stories on, on our new Instagram account, which I'm going to tell you about later. So um, the next thing we're going to do, as we send you off, those who want to go with Lily, those who want to stay in church with uh, their families are welcome to. Now I'm going to make an announcement to show just how human I am and how I forget things. We're going to sing a hymn together, which we always do at this point, and then right after the hymn, even though the order of service tells you otherwise, right after the hymn, the choir is going to sing. I was supposed to tell you that. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's head where we're going next. Let's uh, join our voices together in song. Because it's really 
it's really a fun, relaxed, silly, joyful atmosphere of me publicly sight reading in front of a place full of people. Um, and there will be cookies and warm apple cider after. Good morning, everyone. I am doing Minute for Mission, and it's our mission box is to seafarers. So I'm going to do a little Vanna. That's what Kathy calls it. Vanna. I'm not buying vowels. I brought my box. Just want to give you an idea of what you can put, put in it. As soon as I find the list. They did send us a list. This is what they've included. Minutes, mittens or gloves, scarf, toque, had a hard time with that word, socks, toothbrush and toothpaste, uh, disposable razors, deodorant, shampoo or body wash, shaving cream, soap, lip balm, playing cards, pen or pencil or a Nova Scotia souvenir, a postcard or a signed Christmas card. Most people put their first names and Fort Massey. Um, bagged wrapped candy. Now I want to um, emphasize that it is not to be chocolates. Someone thought it would be or could be. No, they don't want chocolates. They melt, they make a mess. So we're talking Werther's or Lifesavers or uh, candy canes, you know, hard candy that they, they can wrap. So I have some examples of everything here. 
I have a boot box. Because I couldn't get everything in a box. The other thing Joy wanted me to emphasize, the volunteer I spoke with, uh, was you, they realize, and so do we, how expensive things are now. And so not everybody can do a whole box. They are happy to get anything you can get. Uh, they'll take, you know, body wash, shampoo, uh, cosmetic, not cosmetic, yeah, cosmetics. I'm sure all those uh, semen need cosmetics. Um, so toothbrushes, toothpaste, the razors, the shaving cream, the gloves, the mitts. Please make everything that you put in there as far as clothes, as warm as you can, because you know they're out on the high seas and it's cold. So, here's my toque. And a pair of, whoops, there are a pair of gloves, nice warm gloves. I've got a razors, package of razors. You can buy at the dollar store. You may have a pack down there. Um, we have shampoo, have a toothbrush, toothpaste, and because I bought the, the uh, toothbrush in one of these, I bought the little plastic caps that you can get at the dollar store to put on them when they, you know, start to use them. Deodorant. Um, I didn't have candy. I didn't get the candy yet. Oh, lip. Now, I've used, this is my gloss, but lip balm. Something that you don't think of, you know, that they need. And uh, we would like it in probably for the 7th of December, if you can do that, because they have asked us to try to get everything in earlier. They start taking things out to the ships um, in the middle of December, and they take things to the ships till the middle of January. We're talking about 1,500 people that they take care of. That's all. So anything you can do, we would be very appreciative of. Thank you. If you have any questions, Kathy, in the flyer, and I will answer. Oh, Kathy has one more thing. And not to worry, if you can't get them by the 7th, Kathy will take another run down. But we would like the majority, probably, that, that Sunday. And then usually what happens is Kathy and I go Monday or Tuesday, take them, and then we go to lunch. So if anyone wants to join us, they can. Thank you. Here's the list. I'm going to put it up downstairs. So you can just check anything out that you need to. Yes, the seventh is not a Sunday, but we just say these things to just keep you on your toes. But get it here two weeks from today. That's plenty of time. First Sunday in December, the first Sunday of Advent, bring in your gifts. We are going to um, give thanks for the tremendous ability we have to give for the tremendous gifts um, that we know individually and as a community and so there are offering plates at the back that um, that you can give an offering to as you leave today but at this moment we're just saying thank you because that's fair enough so let's sing together a little thank you please of this moment, 
looking for the places where our deepest passion meets the world's greatest need, longing for the patience to know where we are being called, reaching for the perseverance to practice living our faith. Open our hearts to the truth in this word, that it might inform our living. Amen. And a parable from the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a man going off on an extended trip. He called his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one he gave $5,000, to another $2,000 to a third 1,000, depending on their abilities. Then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same, but the man with the single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled the investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with $2,000 showed how he also had doubled his master's investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you, so I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, or at least I would have gotten a little interest. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most. And get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into utter darkness. Offered his wisdom for the journey. Um, I thought it was a good idea to put the scripture right before the sermon, you know, so it would be fresh in your mind. So possibly right now what's fresh in your mind is that the poor fellow who played it safe was sent to the end of darkness. And, and if you read that in other translations, it says that he was um, sent into the fiery darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> I'm starting to think it might have been good that the anthem uh, just before the sermon, so you might have forget, forgotten all of that stuff. What did the poor guy do, right? He played it safe, he did nothing illegal, nothing immoral, just like what most of us would do. And, and I kind of, I, these are the moments I get a little annoyed at Jesus or, or maybe his editors. Like, why do we need to leave it on that note? And then why do I need to spend time unpacking that? Because that's what we're going to get stuck on in this message. Um, but there you have it. It's helpful to remember that this is a parable, right? So it's not a literal story. I don't believe for a second that if you play life safe, that you will be eternally damned. It's that, that's not the point here. Not the point. But I do wonder what is that, that utter darkness? And I've been thinking of that this week and thinking, hmm, I think I've been there. Like, I, I think sometimes we actually condemn ourselves to utter darkness, not that God throws us there. I'm not thinking of grief or that sort of loss. I'm thinking of utter darkness as being that place that we end up. And, and we don't notice at first, but we look back and we're like, well, I'm lost. I'm kind of numb. I'm kind of living from my fears. I, like, what have I done with my time and my life? That, that place where you just eventually reflect and say, 
<laughs> I've got to get out of here. So the utter darkness is where this guy ends up. And, and I'm feeling like utter darkness, and you can um, let me know if you can relate by, you know, I don't know, sighs or amens. We don't usually do that around here, do we? But feel free to amen me if I get you right on this. Um, you know, when we're living from fears of, uh, feelings of fear and resentment, when we're worried that people will see, oh my goodness, if they only knew the truth. And so we kind of just keep ourselves quite guarded. That, to me, is the kind of stuff that leads to utter darkness. It's in a sense that we bury what we're afraid will kill us, or, or to be less dramatic, we bury what we're afraid will unravel us. At least I know that I have. So, I remember this time, not that many years ago, I'm in kind of a heated debate with a colleague. And, and you know in those heated debate moments when you let your guard down and you say the things that, you know, that you've buried and you didn't mean to say? <laughs> so I say to this colleague, I'm so insecure, I walk around with imposter syndrome and here you are telling me all the terrible ways I'm doing my job. And my colleague stops and says to me, like quite seriously, I thought you were made of Teflon. Like, I, I, I honestly thought nothing stuck to you. And what I realized in that moment is I've been really, really successful at putting forward this image of myself. But here's the beautiful thing that happened in the long run, like not that moment, but started in that moment. That fear I have that I'm no good at what I do or if they only knew, it started taking up like a more reasonable place in my life and in my psyche. Like, it was no longer kind of this great big secret to hide. It was like, oh yeah, there's my fear, there's my I'm not good enough. And it, it just started to take on a more reasonable place in my life. So I don't know, I'm convinced, I am convinced that when we name, when we dare that vulnerability of naming the things that we just want to keep hidden, things can shift. And they can shift for the better, because other people begin to see our common humanity, and we begin to get real about the things that we're trying to hide. And, and over the course of time, beautiful stuff can arise from that. The thing is, though, in the story, if, if it's, it's probably in your distant memory now, although Diane knows it, she clearly practiced it well, in the story, he doesn't actually bury his fears. He buries, in the story, it's his money, his talent, his treasure. He buries his gifts. And it's a lavish amount of gifts. But what I wonder is, do you think maybe when we bury our fears, we're burying our joy as well? That, that inadvertently, we're, we're reducing our ability to engage in life in a fulsome way. The teacher Parker Palmer explains it like this, if we try to avoid doubt and despair and pain, we can find ourselves living without faith and hope and love. So if you try to avoid doubt and despair and pain, you actually have a reduced ability to enjoy life and love and joy. I think there's something to that. I think there might be something to that for us. It's uh, another person who actually looked at the scripture, Frederick Buechner, he's a great story, was a great storyteller. He said specifically, to bury your life is to have it wither in the ground and diminish. It's to be less alive than you were to start with. And I'm thinking, which one of us, which one of us ever has it as our conscious goal to be less alive at the end of the day? Right, when you realize that it's a gift to wake up every morning and take that first breath, which one of us would intentionally try to have less life at the end of the day? So, it's, so I'm, this is not a guilt trip about the things we do that, that, um, that we bury. It's more just trying to expose, I, I hope you're up to it too. Because I know I am, all the time, just trying to like, oh, I just won't speak on that. I'll just, I'll just pretend that I don't have that deep 
rooted fear. And on the flip side, when we risk that vulnerability with one another, I think amazing, amazing things can happen. So um, I want to remember, too, that what this fella did was he invested. He didn't gamble, right? So go to the other two guys. They invested their money. wasn't gambling. Now, if any of you, and I know a few of you have the privilege, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to invest money these days. <laughs> it's no sure thing, right? You can invest wisely, prudently, and you can still lose your shirt. The other thing of note, the master was gone for a very long time. So although Jesus is like in the parable, oh, you, uh, you invested wisely and you made lots more on your investment. Well, it might have taken years. It might have been like five dips in the market before they ever doubled their investment. Our investment in our own life, in choosing the vulnerability it takes to be the people God would have us be, it's like a long game pass. There are ups and downs that this parable kind of doesn't acknowledge on the way. But I do want us to think about what does it mean as a community to be people who are, you know, not gamblers, but maybe venture capitalists. What, what does it mean to be people who take reasonable risks with the gifts that God has given us? And, and can we live with that? And if we name our fears about it, can we do it a little more fulsome? You know how it is when you try to take risks, when you try to do things a little differently, and you're starting out on a new venture, and you're starting out, so this is going to be my new vulnerable self. I'm going to speak truth. I'm going to try the hard thing. And it is hard slogging. Because you have countless moments when you take a risk that you're sure is leading to more whole life. There are countless moments where that little voice of doubt comes in. This very week, I, I thought I tried something new on your behalf. Um, I started an Instagram account. That, apparently, we already have one, but now we have two. So I started an Instagram account because I'm thinking, if we want, if we want to see any millennials or Gen Zs, you know, come through the door more regularly, we got to be on Instagram. They got to be able to find us. So thanks to my children and their Jewish and atheist friends we got about six followers. <laughs> and then, my greatest joy this week was the one person who joined organically. I didn't tell them about it, member of this church, who found the Instagram page and started following it. Yes, success. But there, and then I realized there's another Instagram, and uh, you know, now I've made a mess of things. But it's okay, you gotta keep taking the risks. Trying the new thing. There is this um, this theory you might know about. And I'm talking about this because I feel like I've been called here to like let's try new things. COVID's over, time to come alive again. And I'm, I've found this really helpful. Marketers have taken this on, but it's actually a socialist, uh, not a socialist, but as I like a Freudian slip, a sociologist in the 1960s who came up with this theory. Um, it's called diffusion of innovation theory, but, but you would have heard of it in a marketing sort of way as the adoption curve. So marketing people use this when they're trying to bring a new product to market. And um, there's, there's sort of different ways that new ideas uh, take root within the heart of the community. So there are the people who innovate new ideas, who come up with, here's the thing. And in church language, we'd say, here's where spirit is calling us. Here is the new thing God is doing. Let's go for it. So corporate world thinks Steve Jobs, right? I'm going to pretend that I'm the innovator, which is probably not really true at all. But I know there's a few of you out there that are. So let's say some of us have new ideas for our congregation. We come forward with the... What happens next? Well, there are the first type of people called the early adopters who get on board. Yeah, great idea, we're gonna try that. They go in wholehearted, let's try it. That's about 13% of the population, so if you think there's maybe 30 of you out there, that's about four of you who would be saying, great new idea. 
And then you have the early adopters and the late adopters who, um, uh, they come on board eventually. And then there's, there's the people when it comes to change who say, yeah, I know it's, you've all proven that it's working, that it's tried and true, that this is a really good idea, but no thank you. Those people are unfortunately, um, they're called the laggards, which I don't think is very complimentary. And one, and this could hit a little too close to home, but one person described the laggards as the people who are going around with cell phones in their pocket only because they cannot find a rotary dial phone to use. <laughs> so, anyway, we love the laggards too. We're all, so if there's change in this community, because I've come in here and I'm stirring things up. It's okay if it seems too wild and crazy for you. But what happens is, if we dare to say, okay, here's my fear, here's why I think that's not a good idea, then at least we can have a conversation, right? If we bury our concerns, we don't get anywhere. Because we know that we are sometimes our worst enemy when it comes to uh, burying our own potential and our own gifts. We are the worst at doing that when we step in and say, yeah, we tried that once, didn't work. No, that's not how we do it around here. Or that, my favorite, and this is a universal church truth. Somebody says, I am so tired, I can't do that job in the church anymore. And then we go and find someone else to do it, and suddenly the person who is exhausted is saying, I can't do it that way. <laughs> That's not how we do it. If we can have conversations with each other, just to pull out that stuff, not in judgment, but, oh, look, we're being human again. Oh, look, what's the fear underneath the action? I think we could do amazing, amazing things. So I'm going to read for you. And I want you to keep this in mind, not just for our church community, but for your own life. I'm going to read these words from a favorite uh, pastor of mine, Bruce Epperly. And uh, I'm going to say it because he said it. These aren't my words. But let me just, in speaking about the scripture, here's what Bruce Epperly had to say. Often congregations are too careful with their resources, preferring a gradual slip into irrelevance and oblivion, to taking the risks necessary for growth and faithfulness in their particular situation. Adventure, he says, or the kingdom of God, or life abundant, is risky. It's also rewarding and opens us up to new gifts and horizons of possibility. I just want us to be thoughtful about how do we embrace change in a world that is changing so quick that all we want is something to hold on to that's familiar? Part of that is trusting but that we're not alone. You see, I think where we can fall, uh, get it in the wrong direction, interpreting a scripture like this or any of them, is this idea that um, God's going to come in and fix it for us. The great contemporary teacher James Finley says that indeed God protects us from nothing and sustains us in all things. God protects us from nothing and sustains us in all things. And the reason I truly believe that there is wisdom in that is that I'm not into a competitive God of you made more money on your investment because you were a better Christian. Or your prayer got answered because you prayed harder. All of our prayers count, but there's a lot of forces at work in the world that can make an outcome not what we would have wanted. But God sustains us in everything. When we risk that vulnerability, we begin to learn and we begin to actually see in how others show up that God sustains us in everything. Whatever comes in your life in this week, Whatever happens to this congregation, God sustains us in everything. That's what we need to be looking for. That's what we need to be looking towards. Where is that sustaining power of the Holy Spirit alive and at work? And we're only going to find that if we're not buried in the sand, but dare to lift up our gifts and share them lavishly, invest them wisely, but invest them in the kingdom. One final story. 
Thomas Edison is said to have done thousands of experiments before he figured out the whole light bulb thing. So someone asked him about his failures, and he said, I, I didn't fail at anything. I just figured out 10,000 ways we couldn't do it. <laughs> Let's be a people like that. Let's lean into the truth of the Holy Spirit's at work and lifting us up and what a beautiful gift that is. Share your treasure, share it lavishly and abundantly, and you will see intangible acts that you are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's a moment that we call the prayers of the people, and uh, it's kind of bold of me to think that I know the prayers of your hearts this day. So uh, a reminder that your prayers are held in this space as well. As we lead into the prayers, just an acknowledgement, this congregation is going through an affirming process, reflecting on how are we welcoming of all who come through our doors. Tomorrow is the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance, where we acknowledge uh, the, those in the transgender community who have been the victims of violence this year. It's a pretty um, narrow focus and a pretty specific focus on a very marginalized group. And so in our prayer time, we keep in our hearts uh, the 320 reported people who were killed this year because they were trans or gender diverse. The vast majority of those, 94%, were trans women or trans feminine people. Most were black. Uh, so just marginalized again and marginalized and more and more. And so we keep them and, and that struggle in our hearts. Likewise, as we keep the prayers for peace in our world. So just join with me in this time of, of joining our hearts together. Let us pray. Holy mystery source of life and love. We offer bold words of thanksgiving that we can worship together, that we have places of community that sustain us, encourage us, even challenge us to become our best selves and who you would have us be. We give thanks for the ways our hearts have been touched this week and our hope has been inspired. And we lift up prayers for those we know who are grieving, those who have been through tremendous strain and struggle and anxiety, those we care about, we don't quite know how to support. We're mindful of those who struggle for justice, those who don't know peace even in their own homes, those who are weary from the struggle. Remind us, O oh God, that our contributions to your common good matter. Inspire us to be a people of love and conviction. And may we have what we need 
to sustain that journey of welcome and love for all we need. O oh God, we offer these prayers and the prayers that we each hold individually in our hearts in trust that they are held and heard in your love. We offer them in the name of the great teacher who taught us to pray as if we are praying to a mother who loves us deeply. Speak with me, if you're able, these words of the Jesus prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together.
And this week, whatever happens, whatever is before you, the expected, the unexpected, know that you are 100% fully forgiven for all the mistakes and missteps, the intentional and the unintentional, and dare this week to step into the beauty of the gift of your light. Dare. Dare to take the risk of making a mess, of doing it wrong, of being rubbish, as they say, because your light is worth sharing. Go in the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Yes, again.